What a powerful testimony. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Tammy, for serving. And uh, Rick, today, asked Paul to take you to see our Mill Crick. And uh, it's a local crick. Or the Peckway Crick is another one. Is that right, Paul? Good to see you. I'll see you tomorrow at noon. All right. I like to keep Rick around. He's great. All right. <laughs> I'm glad you feel the love. That's good. You're dismissed now. So, <laughs> If you'd open the Bible, your Bible, to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 16 through 39. We're not going to read this passage right now. We're going to read it and woven through the sermon, actually. But I uh, just want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open if you have your Bible with you, or you can also follow along on the screen. As we dig in to the Old Testament this fall in our study of the life of God's prophet Elijah, I realize that for many people, the Old Testament is truly foreign territory. It's not your normal go-to part of the Bible for most people, but it is God's Word inspired, infallible, and errant, authoritative. We need to read it. We need to study it. And here's what I believe about the Old Testament. First of all, it is ancient. Uh, for example, the stories of Elijah, they are 3,000 years old. A couple weeks ago, our five-year-old grandson, Cam, said, Grand Papa, how old are you? I said, 59. He said, whoa, you're old. I said, no, not really. I'm in my prime. He said, oh, Papa. And that's true. You know, I'm not old. I mean, look at this. It's a 3,000-year-old story. That's old. That's ancient. But hear me. It is also true. Just because it's old doesn't mean that it's irrelevant and that it's not true. The Old Testament is true, and it is trustworthy. The Old Testament contains stories about how to live our lives and how not to live our lives. And, and so when you read in the Old Testament stories about like Abraham taking multiple wives, you don't look at that and say, is God approving that? No, he's, God is showing you what happens when you go outside of his plan and disobey him and do things that you should not do. The Old Testament is resplendent with all of those kinds of stories. But it's also true that sometimes you read stories and you think, what? It's, it's true that it's not always easy to understand. And so that's why it's important to have Bible dictionaries and Bible handbooks and Bible teaching to help you unlock the truths in the Old Testament. But here's one thing which is absolutely true. You can build your life on it. And it's simply this fact that every story, every passage in the Old Testament is about God. He is the central character. And no matter what you read, no matter what you study, you can take a step back and look at it and say, what do I learn about God from this story, this subject? And that really kind of paves the way into the story in 1 Kings chapter 18 today because we want to talk about God. We want to talk about God today. He is infinitely glorious and worthy of our praise and adoration. There is no one who is like God, amen? There is no one who is like him. He always has been, always will be. He is completely self-sufficient. God is the uncreated creator who sustains the universe and governs the earth. He has all power, knows all things, is everywhere present. God alone has the right to command our obedience, our love, our devotion, and therefore, God is rightfully jealous when we do not worship and serve him. To worship anything or anyone other than the triune God of the Bible rightly provokes God to jealousy, and it cannot be any other way. Now, in most cases, jealousy is not a commendable virtue. Shakespeare, in his play Othello, referred to jealousy as a green-eyed monster, and the label stuck through the years. And so, to think that God is jealous can be troubling to quite a number of people, until we realize that God's jealousy is an outpouring of his absolutely deep love for every one of us, every single one of us. One of the Ten Commandments says this, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Simply stated, God wants to be the first and only God in your life. God wants to be the first and only 
God in your life. Hear that? God wants to be the first and only God in your life. He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. God does not want to share you with another God, just as no loving husband wants to share his wife with another man. No loving wife wants to share her husband with another woman. God does not want to share you in any way with another God. God wants you to love him above and beyond anything and anyone else in life. And that brings us to the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Now just a quick review. The nation of Israel is currently in the midst of a very severe drought in 1 Kings chapter 18. No rain, no dew to water the land for three plus years. The drought, as we learned two weeks ago, is the result of God's judgment upon Israel for their sin. For 60 years, they have been governed by a series of kings who have been sinful and evil, and now they have the worst of them all. They have King Ahab and his delightful wife, Queen Jezebel, or not. And they are evil beyond all of the other kings who have occupied the throne of Israel. And so here we have God basically in 1 Kings chapter 18 saying, enough, enough. I have had enough. And you remember from two weeks ago that God calls a prophet out of nowhere. His name is Elijah. He has no credentials to speak of. And he is brought immediately into the presence of the king. There is no introduction. There is no letter. Nothing. 1 Kings chapter 17 opens and Elijah shows up in the throne room and gets into the face of Ahab. And this is what he says. The Lord God... The God of Israel lives whom I serve. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Except at my word. What a powerful and incredible judgment announced by Elijah on Israel. And you can imagine, as Pastor Paul said last week, that this made Elijah the most wanted in all of Israel. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 18, the word of God says that, that Ahab started to search all over every nation, every kingdom, trying to find Elijah because he wanted to get his hands on that man and have him say at his word, bring rain so he could end the drought in his land. But God would have none of it. God protected Elijah. God provided for Elijah. We know from the scriptures that God actually was preparing Elijah to be a courageous and bold prophet and a powerful witness for the truth of God. As we meet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, the drought is now in its third year. We can only imagine the desperate state of the nation as the food supplies were steadily drying up. It was in the midst of this desperation that the word of the Lord, according to the Bible, came again to Elijah. And this time, God said this to Elijah, go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain. Now, can I just tell you that if I were Elijah at this moment, I would say to God, how about if you just send rain? And let's just skip the Ahab part, okay? Because I'm not wanting to go to Ahab right now. He has been searching for me in every kingdom, every nation, and just play with me a little bit. Every post office in Israel has my picture in it. That's a little loose, but, you know, I, I'm the most wanted. So, you know, God, is there a plan B here because I don't like the idea of presenting myself to Ahab? But you know what? Elijah doesn't say that at all. Elijah is incredibly faithful to God. And without hesitation... Because God has prepared him for this moment with fearless faith, without hesitation, Elijah immediately does what God calls him to do. He looks up a godly official in Ahab's government, a man named Obadiah, and he goes to him and he asks Obadiah to make the introduction to Ahab. Just go to Ahab, he says, and say, Elijah is here. Well, it took a little convincing, but finally Obadiah agreed to do that only on the condition that Elijah agreed not to disappear again. And so, indeed, Obadiah walked into the presence of evil King Ahab and said to him, Elijah is here. 
Ahab immediately responded, went to the place where Elijah was located, and this is the conversation in 1 Kings chapter 18. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And to Ahab, Elijah responded, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Isn't it interesting how people try to excuse their behavior by blaming the other person, especially when they know that they themselves are indeed guilty, that they are the ones who've led their nation into such evil and and sin, and that's exactly what Ahab does. He tries to shift the blame over to Elijah, but Elijah has been prepared by God to be fearless and courageous, and he looks him in the eye, and with power he says, not me, don't put the blame on me, it's you and your father's family. You are the reason that this drought has taken place. You have chosen to worship the Baals. And what happens next? What happens next is one of the most dramatic scenes in the entire Bible. Elijah orders Ahab to summon the people from all over Israel to a place called Mount Carmel. And then he says, bring with them the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah, friends, is planning a showdown of the gods. A showdown of the gods. You know what's so interesting about this passage? Elijah, the lowly prophet from a town called Tishbe that nobody knows where it's at anymore, looks into the eyes of the mighty King Ahab and says, you do this, you do this, you do this, and the word of God says Ahab did exactly what Elijah told him to do. He called together Israel. He brought with him 450 prophets of Baal. He brought with him 400 prophets of Asherah. Elijah wasted no time in revealing the plan that he had for this showdown between the lifeless gods of Baal and Asherah and the one true and living God. And the reason he wasted no time is this. You see, the real drought in Israel was not a physical one. The real problem for this nation was not that they didn't have rain, not that they didn't have dew. The real drought in Israel was a spiritual one. The absolute absence of love and devotion for the one true and living God. You want proof of that? Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah went before the people of Israel, and he said to them, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow me. And essentially he said, So choose right now. Who are you going to follow, the Lord God or the stone Baal? And look at the condemnatory statement in Scripture of the people of Israel. The people said nothing. Nothing. When I read that again last week in the preparation of this message, I stopped right there and I thought to myself, can you imagine how grieved the heart of God was? As his people, his people, his people, given the opportunity to claim him as their God, to declare so that all would hear, we will follow the Lord as God, said nothing. Stone, silent, just like the gods they were worshiping. But Elijah had a plan, a well-organized and carefully designed plan to reveal who the real God is and call God's people to follow him. He stood before the people and he said this, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. So, Get two bulls for us. Let them, meaning the prophets of Baal, choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord. 
And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And suddenly, the people got their voice back. And they all said, what you say is good. What happens next in this story is absolutely astounding. To his credit, Elijah gives the 450 prophets of Baal home court advantage in this showdown. First of all, he chooses Mount Carmel as the location. You know what Mount Carmel is? It is the stronghold of Baal worship. If there is anywhere in Israel where you would likely find Baal, it would certainly be on Mount Carmel. There were shrines everywhere. You went there to call out to Mount Carmel or call out to Baal, and Baal answered you supposedly on Mount Carmel. And you know what Elijah does? He says, let's make sure that they really know who the real God is. Let's start on their turf. And then on their turf, let's do something else. Let's use fire as the symbol of who God is. Because after all, Baal is also the god of sun. So, you know, he should easily be able to take some of his fire and whip it down to earth and consume that sacrifice. And and you know what? Let's do something else. Let's let them go first. We're not even going to flip a coin. Let's let them go first and give them all day as much time as they need. No time limits. Just keep going until Baal answers you. Talk about home court advantage. Every concession was given to the prophets of Baal in order to bring about their Baal as the living God of the world. Look at what the word of God says. The prophets of Baal called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Ho, Baal, answer us. Ho, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And then they danced around the altar that they had made because, you see, in the ancient days, they believed that the way you got your God's attention is you had to yell real loud, and if he didn't hear you, you had to dance. And and, and so at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, shout louder, he said. Surely he's a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling for a fall vacation to the New England states. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he needs to be awakened. In fact, in this particular passage, there are some Hebrew words that are so unique, found nowhere else in the Bible, that there are Bible scholars who actually believe that one of the things Elijah said was, maybe he's in the bathroom and you just need to give him time to get out of the bathroom. That would really fit in Elijah's personality, taunting the prophets of Baal. So they shouted louder. They flashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until the blood flowed because if your shouting doesn't get Baal's attention, if your dancing doesn't wake him up, maybe your blood will wake him up. Midday passed. They continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him. There on Mount Carmel, probably off to the side, there was a broken down altar that had one time seen a lot of action when God's people were worshiping him. It was now in a dilapidated, broken state of disrepair, kind of a sign of the disregard that Israel had with God. Jenny and I have taken a couple trips over the past 10 years to New England. The New England States is one of those areas of our nation which has a high rate of church closures as we would drive through towns and villages and we would see closed churches boarded up, broken down. It's heartbreaking. You realize that if you put all the seats and all the churches in America together, added them up, there would not be enough seats if God sent a true awakening and revival on our nation. There would not be enough seats in all the churches to seat all the people And so any time a church closes, it must grieve the heart of God. The altar of God was in a state of disrepair. It was abandoned 
which is symbolic of the fact that Israel had abandoned God. But Elijah was determined to put an end to this and to put an end to the spiritual drought in his nation. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 31 forward. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and dug a trench around it, large enough to hold about two seahs, that is about 13 quarts of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. And then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now where in the world did he get all this water in a drought? Well, Mount Carmel is on the edge of the salty Mediterranean Sea. Fill four large jars, pour it on every part of this offering. I'm sure there were men there saying, that's probably not a good idea. You don't want to wet it down before you call on God to burn it up. But you know what Elijah said? Do it again. And they did it again. You know what Elijah said? Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. And at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward, and this is what he prayed. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and the wood, now notice this, and the stones and the soil. How many of you have ever seen stones and soil burned up and disintegrated completely? And just to make sure we didn't miss this, even the water got licked up in the trench. And all the people who saw this fell prostrate, and they called, the Lord he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Say it with me. The Lord, he is God. The prophets of Baal had spent all day shouting and dancing and slashing themselves, trying to get Baal to at least say something, and he said nothing, and he did nothing, and you time it, Elijah prayed 30 seconds in the presence of God. And God heard and answered and sent fire to prove who is the real God. The showdown on Mount Carmel is not just dramatic, friends. It is decisive. This showdown answered a question for Israel, and as it did, it raised a second one. The question it answered is simply this, who's got the power? Who's got the power? The Lord, he is God, and he has all power. It is why the writer to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, that our God is a consuming fire. It's why woven through the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, that our God is an omnipotent God. He possesses all power. He is all powerful. The truth of the matter is, this incredible miracle on Mount Carmel answered the question for Israel, who's got the power? Not Baal, not Asherah, but the one true and living Lord. The miracle on Mount Carmel put idols in their place then and now. God's people, God's people, even here in the United States of America right now, still have idols in their lives. Idols draw us away from a full commitment to God. Idols like money, jobs, politics, Agendas, 
hobbies, sports, working for retirement, building our reputation. Here's one of the biggest idols today, living the good life. It's my idol. It's what I turn my attention to. It's what I live for. These aren't stone bales or wood asher poles, but we give them all the attention and ascribe to them all the value that is due really only to our relationship with God. Here's the truth. None of our idols have the power to do for us what God can do for us. Did you hear that? None of our idols have the power to do for us what God can do for us. Let me tell you something about yourself. Let me tell you something about me. I am not just a physical being with material needs. If Mike Sigmund was simply a physical being with material needs, then my eternity doesn't matter because when I die, guess what? (laughs) It's the end. And, And as a physical being, my material needs are money and food and, you know, job. And so therefore, yeah, go ahead. Worship the good life. Worship money. Worship building your reputation because after all, you're just a physical being with material needs. But we aren't that. We have the very image of God imprinted on us. We are spiritual beings with hearts and souls. Listen, we need and long for the forgiveness of our sin. We want someone to take away the guilt, to remove the shame. Man, we are people who long for peace, desperately need hope. We embrace any kind of help that comes when no one cares about us except him. And let me tell you something. All the idols that we worship, they cannot do for you what God can do for you. Which is why God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It is why God came in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, yet without sin, grew into manhood, and roughly at the age of 33, scholars would say, He went to a cross, not because someone took his life, but because he gave his life. For you, Dave, and for you, John. For you, Barb. He gave his life for you, Sierra. He gave his life for you. For the entire Lugood Barley clan, he gave his life. The entire Herb clan, he gave his life. Standing in our place, dying for our sin. And on the third day, the word of God says, by the power of God, he was raised again from the dead. And he lives today. He is seated on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. He is alive and he's offering to us the free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sin, a new and eternal life. We are not just physical beings with material needs. We are people who long for something far deeper and there is no idol that can satisfy it. There is only one God and he's got the power, amen? He's got the power. This story answered that question for Israel. It answers it for us. But it raises another question. And the other question is this, who's on the throne? This awesome display of God's power at Mount Carmel made it very clear that God is the true king of Israel. Ahab is not. (laughs) And thank God Jezebel isn't. I told you two weeks ago, there's a reason her name isn't in the baby book of names. (laughs) Baal isn't. Asherah isn't. That day, it became very clear that the Lord God is on the throne of Israel. Likewise, the awesome display of God's power at the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ boldly announced that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. He alone is on the throne. He is high and lifted up, seated on the throne, and the government of every nation of the entire universe is on his shoulders. There is no one who is like him. Which leads to a question. Who's on your throne? Who's on your throne? When I was a kid in Sunday school, occasionally a teacher would draw on the chalkboard. That was an early instrument used to teach (laughs) in both schools and Sunday schools. She would draw on a chalkboard a circle. This is your life. She would then draw inside the circle what looked to be a chair. This is the throne in your life. And she would ask us, who sits on the throne in your life? And the answer should be Jesus Christ. But some of our circles have gotten a little crowded Because once in a while she would show us how sometimes we get kind of off kilter and we wander away and we forget. And she'd draw a second chair, maybe a third. And she'd say, you see this? God doesn't want to share his place in your life with anyone or anything else. And she was right. The word of God teaches that. Because you see, our God is a jealous God. And he jealously guards his love relationship for you, and he doesn't want to share you with anyone or with anything. He wants to sit on the throne of your life. It's what this whole miracle was about for Israel. And it's what it means for us today. He's got the power. Does he have your throne? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these stories that you have preserved for us in your word that teach us truth about who you are, your character, the way you work. It's amazing. Grateful for these stories. And for this story about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, thank you. Thank you that through it you are calling us to examine closely who's on the throne of our hearts. Lord, we are God's people gathered here if we know you as Savior and Lord of our lives, Jesus. And I pray for myself and for all my brothers and sisters here that you would search our hearts and look at the thrones in our lives. And my prayer today is that where you are needing to share space, that there would be on the part of those people, uh, true repentance of turning away from those idols that have captured their attention, captured their devotion, siphoned away what is rightfully yours, and that you would do a work today of revival in the hearts of your people so that you would once again take that rightful place that is only yours as the true Lord and King of every heart in this place and online. Lord, may there be a revival of biblical faith in you alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name.